uh, chat, um, or you can also contact us. So uh, some of our team is going to be here on chat. If you want to get contact information, please do so. And as you join, please make sure that you are uh, muting your microphones. Um, we will be having a question and answer portion of this webinar at the end. So please use that section to uh, ask any questions at the end. And in the meantime, uh, as you join, please uh, make sure that you mute your microphone and uh, you are obviously welcome to use to ask any questions at this time. Okay, and we will start in a couple of minutes. And Pratim, if you could please record the session. Okay, welcome everyone to the program. We're going to start and uh, today's session is a part of our program called the Hands-On Biomedical Data Science. It's a part of our series called Omics Logic. Uh, in this series, we talk about different types of data and we talk about different types of analyses as well as challenges. So uh, this particular program, the data science program is focused on uh, preparing the data for analysis using visualization, using processing tools, and then using practical uh, approaches to get insights from that data. And we'll talk a lot about machine learning uh, and data normalization, preparation, visualization, and other things. So this is a full course that combines user-friendly processing and machine learning methods designed for high throughput biomedical data with practical skills in R, in Excel, on the T-BioInfo platform, uh, to visualize and gain director insights and make your research reproducible, data-driven, and more impactful. The program is focused on biomedical data, and we look at biomedical data in the context of uh, specific types of data and specific types of questions. Um, and so when we will talk through this session today, we'll be focused on next generation sequencing and omics technology. So we'll talk about a variety of different use cases for uh, this type of technology. And we'll talk about different tools that you can use uh, to process and analyze uh, this kind of data. And so today's session is, again, a free session for anybody that is uh, learning about the Omics Logic program, learning about this specific data science program. If you're still um, not registered, we encourage you to ask any questions that you have about the program, the duration of the program, the types of activities that we have, and you can place your questions in the chat box, and we'll be happy to answer those. So I hope that everybody that wanted to join has joined, and uh, let's talk about the program a little bit. So the program is split up into five different parts. Four of these parts are introductory in, in the sense that they are designed for training. And then the fifth part is actually focused on projects. So uh, this session is uh, going to be the conclusion of our introductory session. Uh, section and the introductory section is really designed to introduce everybody to high throughput data experiments, challenges and opportunities associated with high throughput molecular data. Uh, it will introduce different types of omics technologies, including genomics, transcriptomics, uh, and other type uh, of data types, uh, for example, metagenomics. Um, and we'll talk about different types of studies, uh, studies related to precision medicine, uh, molecular data analysis for mechanistic understanding, and topics like drug discovery, 
uh, and discovery of drug efficacy. Uh, then the second portion of the program, uh, we will be talking about exploratory data analysis, the need for statistical understanding of our data properties and characteristics, and the way to prepare data for analysis. So a lot of steps are needed to introduce, uh, first of all, convert the data from unstructured to structured. Uh, and then once that processing step is done, you also have to play around with data to prepare it for the type of analysis that you will be doing because these different things have assumptions about the data, data distribution, um, and other properties that to uh, identify by looking um, at our data from the standpoint of visualization um, and uh, statistical analysis. So we'll talk about probability, correlation, association, and we'll talk about some common data visualization techniques that are typically used for exploratory data analysis. And we'll use two examples using Excel and using R. And we'll, we'll start talking about how you can, and, and you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing things in Excel. There's nothing wrong with doing things in R. A lot of people would probably do it in both. Some things are easier to do in Excel. Some things are easier, easier to do in R. And eventually, as you specialize, you kind of pick uh, the type of environment that is most uh, relevant to what you are doing. So after that, we're going to talk about data mining. Uh, for data mining, we'll uh, talk about machine learning techniques that help us reduce the dimensionality of our data, so things like principal component analysis and some others. And then we'll talk about what are the features, what are the objects, how do we actually find uh, insights uh, using some of these data mining techniques, and we'll talk about clustering methods as well. In the context of clustering and principal component analysis, we'll also talk about data preparation that can help us uh, make the most insights uh, when we look at the results. Then we'll talk about classification, and classification is a uh, number of uh, machine learning methods that are used for discriminant analysis, uh, decision trees uh, using uh, varieties of decision trees like random forest, and support vector machines. So we'll really talk about a number of different methods there. After these first five uh, sections of the program, we believe that any one of you is going to be ready to do their own analysis. Now, this is not a requirement. This is something that we think is going to be helpful to you. So we will help uh, prepare the project idea so that your project idea is clear and very defined and focused. And then we will help you apply your idea and the project design to uh, the actual um, data set of your choice. So we'll talk about how to find the data, how to prepare the data, how to process and analyze the data. And then finally, how might you interpret that data? During that time, we'll be available to help uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis that you will be able to connect with uh, some of our team and discuss, but also we'll kind of walk you through a process of submitting that kind of information. So what is omics data? Let's talk about the history of genomic data to understand how we got to where we are today. So as we all remember in the 1950s, the DNA double helix structure was discovered. And as a result of that discovery, we understood that the way that DNA was organized, that the way that this uh, uh, so, um, the that this uh, data is recorded in the DNA has to do with a sequence. And that sequence of DNA, the uh, nucleotides in the DNA, is really what we call today genomic data. So uh, later on, as this discovery became more practical, uh, what we applied it to is the assembly of a full genome. How do we put together a full sequence? And in this case, we used it on the human genome. Uh, again, sorry, somebody's uh, turning on the microphone, so I'm going to, okay, and uh, anyone that's joining now, uh, just please uh, mute yourself uh, as you are joining. Uh, again, if you have your video on, you can go ahead and turn that off, uh, and if you have any questions, please feel free to, uh, to ask them in chat. Um, Okay, so uh, assembly of the human genome project, just to give you a perspective where we are today with that, 
As a result of that project, the Human Genome Project, uh, next generation sequencing uh, was uh, started to become more and more affordable. And so uh, Illumina picked up that idea of shotgun sequencing and really made uh, a very popular nowadays application of next generation sequencing making it cheaper and more effective and more precise. So as a result, uh, we now have in 2015, by 2015, there was already 1,000 of genomes, of human genomes, uh, and that was the 1,000 Genome Project. And uh, in 2018, we're actually talking about thousands and thousands of genomes. For example, there is a 100,000 uh, genome project uh, by Genomics England and, and, and at the Broad Institute. Um, and recently you might have heard that uh, the UK Biobank is a new project that is the most ambitious yet that will actually assemble 500,000 genomes. So there is an exponential growth of this data. What does this data really look like? Uh, so the data really comes in a sequencing machine that looks something like this. This is the HiSeq 2500. And the high seq 2500 produces fast Q format of data. So the fast Q format of data, when we say it's unstructured, it looks like this. So it essentially has reads. These short reads can be anywhere between 30 and 300 base pairs long. And for each one of these letters that you see here, you have a quality score as well. And that's why it's called fast Q. Q stands for quality. We also collect information that was assembled from these short reads in files that are FASTA format. So for example, the human genome would be in the FASTA format. So this is the same type of a uh, format where you can see individual letters of the code, but they don't contain the quality. They actually are assembled in longer reads. So here you can see uh, reads and sometimes you can uh, also see whole chromosomes uh, assembled in a file that looks like this. So what is, um, you know, what are some uses for the FASTA files? The FASTA files are actually uh, files that a lot of times are used for full genomes. So here you can see a couple of full genomes. So this is the genome of Spotoptera frugiperida, uh, where you can see that this is the genome shotgun sequence. So it's an assembly of the full genome, and it looks something like this. This is a virus right here, and the, the complete genome of this rabies virus looks something like this, so just a continuous sequence of letters. What is shotgun sequencing? Shotgun sequencing, so as you saw over here, these are individual reads. So let's try and understand how these reads actually are prepared. So these reads um, are first, uh, the DNA, the genomic DNA is shattered, uh, so it's sheared into these pieces, and these pieces, about 200 to 300 base pair fragments, uh, you can see that then adapters are attached to the beginning and end of each read. And this is an example of a paired end read sequencing. And then in a flow cell, that data is amplified using PCR amplification. Then the sequencer, what it does is it reads out in each flow cell, it looks at the color and the color is associated with a letter. That's why you also have the quality control because the letters are not always so clear that you can understand that that is, let's say, T, G, C, or A. And so as a result, we have this kind of a sequence, as you saw. Uh, there's a label. So for example, you can see here that this is uh, the label of the read. This is an individual position of that read. And this is the quality. So the Q score is 25. How is next generation sequencing applied in the context of this biological process that happens at the subcellular level? And I'm sorry, I see that um, we have uh, something on the screen. So let me just uh, uh, see how I can. Uh, maybe remove that annotation. Okay. So as you all know, uh, the cell, inside the cell, there's the nucleus and the nucleus 
uh, contains the DNA, but that DNA is expressed in proteins, which are the functional molecules in the cell. So here in this representation, let's just break down the type of omics data that we have for each level of information that we can obtain from the cell. So first of all, the external phenotype, the external observation about what the cell looks like, its shape, etc., is called the phenotype. And we call that phenomics, right? So it's not really omics data in the sense that it's next generation sequencing data, but we can also generate a lot of images, a lot of characteristics. So this could be one type of data. Then we have the genomic data. The genomic data is really what is recorded in the DNA. And so here you can see an analysis of genomic data. And essentially it tells you what is in the DNA of this specific sample and what is in the reference genome. So what is in the sample compared to the reference genome. And we'll talk about some of the other things that we can do with this kind of data. Then a uh, growing uh, area is called epigenetic uh, analysis or epigenomics. Epigenomics is really the analysis of uh, DNA methylation and histone modification that we can look at from bisulfite sequencing or chip seq, which is chromatin immunoprecipitation. And then we have transcriptomics. Transcriptomics is the analysis of expression of mRNA. And we can also talk about other types of RNAs, microRNAs, uh, and other types of small RNA. So there's really a number of different things that we can study using just next generation sequencing. So for example, in each one of these cases, you will have a different approach to process that data in order to structure the data. For example, in RNA sequencing, it's really the alignment of the reads to the genome and quantification of the aligned reads to genes or isoforms. Uh, in DNA microarray, for example, we can look at how we spot the changes in individual positions, and that will be called variant calling, and that could be done with Illumina next generation sequencing or microarray data. Uh, and then ChIP-seq is chromatin immunoprecipitation, as we spoke. And chromatin immunoprecipitation allows us to understand where the histones are bound to the DNA, so identify those binding sites. RNA editing, we can also explore how RNA is edited in the process of alternative splicing and when it becomes a mature microRNA. So in the context of data analysis, on the platform that we already started introducing last time, these are some of the sections. So you can see that we have a whole section on next generation sequencing data, and we'll try a couple of these sections to understand how the data gets converted from this raw, fast format of short reads, eventually to a structured table that we can actually use in downstream analysis, starting from exploratory data analysis, which is going to be the next topic that we will cover. So here you can see RNA-seq transcriptomics, uh, genomics and epigenetics. You can see the whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, bisulfite sequencing that we talked about, copy number segmentation or copy number variation, uh, where we can uh, look at number of genes that are recorded multiple times in the genome, um, and also metagenomics. So how can we analyze data from microbial communities, the microbiome. So all of these are important techniques to understand, but they all share common principles. And so what we want to look at today are some of those principles that are applied in two types of data, transcriptomics and genomics. So one deals with next generation sequencing of gene expression. Another one deals with next generation sequencing of genomic sequence, the genomic variants. So let's first talk about next generation sequencing, transcriptomics. We have the DNA, and the DNA, only about 1% of that DNA is dedicated to coding genes. In other words, sections of the DNA that record a sequence of a gene. And those genes are not going to be expressed exactly the same way that they are mRNA that they are transcripts. So transcript will be a little bit different from the actual gene. So the gene gets expressed. Some genes don't get expressed. Some get expressed more, some get expressed less. And this mRNA is what we have in our sample. And the sample 
the sample is shattered. So you can see that it's broken down into these short reads. Adapters are attached to the beginning of the end of each one of those reads. Then those reads are amplified using PCR amplification. And then finally, they are read. So the understanding of how the data is prepared is critical for our ability to appropriately process it and prepare it for analysis. So what we want to look at now is we want to take a look at how we can take this understanding and convert it into a data analysis pipeline. Now, another aspect of gene expression is that, as we said, genes, the way they are recorded in the DNA and the way that they are actually expressed are not exactly the, the same way. So there's a process of alternative splicing. We won't go into detail, but let's talk about it from that analysis standpoint. So one of the critical steps is alignment, alignment of these short reads, as you can see right here. These are the different reads that we have in our data. And this is the reference. So the reference has some kind of a sequence of letters, some gaps, and we have a number of reads. And the reads, as you can see, they don't all start from the same location. So the process of alignment is actually looking at how do those reads align to the reference genome, and then using this alignment to understand what kind of exons do we have that combine an actual, that are combined into an actual isoform. So let's talk about how this works in real life. We started doing this last time. And let's do this a little bit again uh, by going to the platform. So uh, thank you, Pratim, for putting in that link. The, um, the platform that I am referring to is the server.t-bio.info. So all of you that have registered for the program should have already received your account information. If you have not received your account information, you just registered, please ask us about this. We will be sending you those details uh, today as soon as the session is over. So the, uh, again, the uh, server uh, will look something like this when you are there. And if you want to see that you are logged in, you will see your details right here uh, in this corner. Uh, and what we want to do today is just briefly go through some of the example pipelines for RNA-seq and for whole exome-seq data. To do this, we actually have a full course uh, that you can take on transcriptomics and on genomics that you can learn about how this works. But in the meantime, you can uh, just learn by looking at some of these examples that we have as demo pipelines. And we'll try to explain as much as possible how these work as we do these pipelines. So right here under transcriptomics, we have this RNA-seq chip parallel analysis of next generation sequencing and microarray data. And we are going to take this first demo pipeline. The demo pipeline uses the cell line data that we started discussing last time. The context of the data is that we are using uh, data from a publication, publicly available data. These are patient-derived cell lines. And we're going to analyze that data for gene expression that can help us identify subtypes of cancer. So let's take a look at how do we prepare several samples into a table of expression. By pressing on start, you can read a little bit about some of the critical steps that are involved in this process. So as you can see, we are going to start by first pre-processing. So pre-processing will help us remove those adapters that were attached and remove the PCR duplicates. Then we are going to map the data that we have to a reference genome. And then we're going to quantify the levels of expression. So the pipeline will look something like this. You can see that this whole section is dealing with pre-processing. This section deals with mapping on transcripts. And this deals with quantification of expression levels. So this is just one example of a pipeline that we can build. Now you can see that the buttons have become darker that I can select. And what I'll do is I'll first use the pre-processing section to use Trimomatic that will uh, find the actual read sequences and remove the adapters and any technical sequences that might be contaminating some of the data that we have. Then we will look for this step of 
amplification. So PCR amplification does not always amplify every section that in a similar way. So what we want to do is we want to remove this technical amplification so that we are left with data that is directly related to the biological problem, the conditions that we are trying to study. Now, then we have two different options. You can see that there's an option for HiSAT, which is going to uh, be a combined strategy on mapping on the genome, detection of exons, and then mapping on junctions. So there's really a combined strategy or we can directly map on transcripts. What's the difference? Well, the difference is, as I mentioned, the genes that are known, the transcripts that are known and are recorded in an annotation file called GTF file, they are not really representative of all the biological variability that exists in real life. And so if we want something very detailed to understand the alternative uh, splicing events we have per sample and really understand the isoforms that are expressed in each sample, we would want to use this combined strategy. If we want to just understand known isoforms or known genes, how are they expressed, we will use this annotation file. And computationally, this is a more effective way of doing it, but you lose some resolution. So let's first try this one. Now here you can see that we're going to be aligning these reads to the reference genome. And we will use an algorithm called Bowtie2. And Bowtie2 is a fast alignment algorithm that is based on the seed or Kamer approach. So this approach is actually somewhat similar to what is used in the Burrow-Wheeler's uh, algorithm that's similar to what is used in when you search for something in Google, for example. It's just an effective algorithm to align a sequence to another sequence. So once we align our sequences, those short reads to the genome, and we understand, or to the transcriptomes are in, we understand that they have covered, they have certain coverage, and then they have a certain amplification in a region, one of the other challenges is to then quantify, taking into account the number of reads that we have in total, and really prepare, give it a real number. So here you can see what that table will eventually look like. You can see that we will have the gene ID, the gene name, across multiple samples, all the samples that we uploaded. And for each sample, we will have a number, and that number will represent the level of expression. So let's click on OK. Now we have prepared our data, pre-processing. We then map the data on transcripts quantified it using expectation maximization technique, which is also a machine learning method, actually. And then we will complete by pressing on end. Now, if you are interested in learning more about some of these transcriptomic data analysis, we encourage you to go to this link, uh, transcriptomics. We have a whole section here on transcriptomics. So you are uh, welcome to take those courses. Uh, those courses are free. And they walk you through all of the steps that I just described right now, but also take it further to talk about differential gene expression and talk about some of the machine learning that we can apply to this kind of data, as well as all the way to single cell RNA-seq, which is a separate section on the platform. Now, once this pipeline completes, again, what is the concept of the pipeline? The pipeline is taking the data loading into each one of these algorithms, completing the algorithm into sequential uh, process where we take the data that goes into the input, the process that a script or algorithm produces a result, and then we pass it on to the next job. So that's really what the pipeline is. And here what you can see is a logical representation of this pipeline. Let's take a look at the result. So we have here a data set called cell lines expression data. So we can download this data just by clicking right here. And once the data is downloaded, we can take a look at what's inside. So we can open this data, for example, a quickest way to open it, let's just open it in Excel. So in Excel, we'll be able to see what the structured version of this data looks like. We saw what the fast Q files look like, and obviously this is something that's very difficult to deal with. And here we can see how we can convert those FASTQ files 
into a structured format. This is called the structured format because it essentially organizes the data by some feature. This right here is the ID of a gene, and this right here is the ID of the sample, of the cell line. So in here, we have these numbers, and these numbers represent the level of expression of this particular gene in this particular sample. Okay, so this was one of the, uh, one of the um, examples for a, an RNA-seq pipeline. Let's just quickly try and create the other more complex version of this pipeline. So again, you can see here that we can start with preparing the data by pre-processing the data. Then we can use HiSat2, which is an algorithm that will look for these variety of ways that the exons could be mapped on the actual genome, and it prepares isoforms. And so we need to now construct these isoforms by looking at the variability because some samples will have exons present, other uh, will not have, and so we need to have a full list of all of those possible isoforms. And then we will use that understanding of the isoforms to actually generate a new GTF file. So the new GTF file will tell us what we are actually mapping onto, right? Because at the end, we will map the reads that we have onto these transcripts. And once we map those onto the transcripts, again, we need to quantify the data that we have. And once we quantify the data that we have, one obvious step that we can do is compare conditions. And this is something that we'll talk a lot more about in future lectures, where we will use DESeq. DESeq will look at differential gene expression. So for example, this is condition number one, this is condition number two. Where are those statistically significant genes that are differentially expressed between two conditions? So we'll talk a lot more about some of these concepts in our lectures, but also I encourage all of you that this is covered in transcriptomics too. You can learn about uh, the p-values and the false discovery rate and, um, and uh, all kinds of um, other concepts that are relevant to this topic. Now, you can see that now we have a bunch more different outputs here. Uh, and the reason is because we are just uh, going through this kind of step by step to understand the complexity, right? So what are some of the uh, files that we have? We have the mapping statistics. So how many of the reads were mapped to the genome? How many were not? Uh, we have the expression of isoforms. We have the expression of genes. And you will notice here FPKM. Uh, and other uh, kind of uh, abbreviations. And we'll talk a lot more about what these abbreviations mean and how do we actually use a variety of normalization techniques to prepare data for analysis. So that was a little bit on the transcriptomic data analysis. And the transcriptomic data analysis is really something that we see as a preliminary step before we can start analyzing and understanding our data. So at this point, I'm gonna just take a moment here and ask anyone, if any one of you has any questions about this process, please feel free to put those questions into the chat and we'll be happy to answer those. Now, we saw how pre-processing of data, uh, mapping of that data on the reference genome, and then some kind of analysis, in that case it was quantification, is used to analyze RNA sequencing data. Now let's talk about genomics data. Genomic data is different, and we can use a variety of methods to analyze that data. And so we'll look briefly at how we can look at individual single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, or SNVs, so we can look at single nucleotide variation, or we can look at copy number variation. Copy number variation is variation of the number of times that a gene is recorded in the DNA. How do we use this data? Okay. 
So how do we use this? Uh, we One of the ways that it could be done is by looking at genome-wide association. So for example, how do we now associate this variation with uh, the phenotype that we have about the sample? Just briefly going through uh, some of the sections that we have here, we have pre-processing, mapping and alignment that you're already familiar with, and then some new sections, including variant calling, differential variant calling, for example, for detection of somatic mutations, annotation of the data, which positions are where and why is that important, for example, using the 1000 Genomes Project, using uh, the database of clinically relevant SNPs, et cetera. And then we have some post-processing sections here as well. Here are a couple of different pipelines that could be created to look at the data from different standpoints. Let's try and create those together so that we understand what type of information we can get out of them. So I can see here that somebody has raised their hand. Uh, maybe at this point it would be best if you could just type your question into the chat and we'd be happy to address that, or we can wait until we have the Q&A session at the end. So right here you can see mutation variant parallel analysis for mutation data. By the way, if you are interested to understand how all of these sections work, you can just quickly hover over and that will tell you a little bit of a background of what we're looking at. So parallel analysis of mutation variant, if you click here, again, we are going to use the same project, the same cell lines, that these are breast cancer cell lines. We're trying to understand subtypes of different breast cancers. And one of the ways to look at the subtypes is to try and look at the genomic variation. So let's quickly create one of our first pipelines. Now it's important to understand that the individual positions that are changing in the DNA actually have an impact on the way that the protein ultimately will be produced, but the protein is produced from mRNA. So the process of going from DNA to mRNA to protein is uh, clarified by this ability to look at, first of all, uh, how the tricodons, or sorry, the trinucleotide codons are recorded, and then how those codons produce amino acids. So. Uh, quickly, a question here, how to upload default FASTQ files. So this is a demo version, and then when we talk about actual processing of the data, you will use the non-demo accounts, and there are a few steps to configure before you actually upload, but then we will use, uh, we, we are happy, you know, maybe to get on uh, a call to explain how to use that. So, but to run the default pipeline, there is no need to upload anything, this is just uh, a demo. Okay, so uh, one of the things that we can do is we can align the data to the reference genome, and then we can visualize that, right? So to visualize the data, what we can do is uh, use uh, JBrowse, uh, a method that will show us the actual um, the actual reads aligned to the reference genome. So once we click on end, you can also see here that we have a collection of uh, lectures on genomics, including introduction to genomics and genomics one. And right now we are working on genomics two that will be available uh, soon. So let's take a look at the result of visualization. So this is the visualization of a couple of samples. So you can see here that I have two samples. Uh, SRR925765 and SRR925766. So this is just two files. And this is the alignment of those reads to the reference genome. So you can see that I have a sequence of the genome. And then I have accumulation of reads. So this is called the abundance. And then here I can actually see the nucleotides and I can see individual positions where I have a change, right? And you can see that this change is identified by this little mark um, on this level. Now, if I zoom out, I'm just going to quickly zoom out here, you can see that actually only portions of the genome have some coverage. So the coverage of the genome is positioned right here. I can see the annotation, that GTF file that we started talking about. And the GTF file records the positions of exons and genes on the genome. So now I have this annotated 
uh, annotation the, or the annotation with the positions of these exons and genes. And you can see that this is a gene called P53. And P53, of course, is a gene that is important for uh, somatic mutations occurring in uh, apoptosis uh, and an important gene in cancer. So you can see a number of things from just visualizing this data. First of all, we know that this is whole exome sequencing, right? Because the reads are only positioned in the regions annotated by genes. So this is only genes. So that's what whole exome sequencing means. The second thing is that we can quickly browse through and look at a variety of positions and even search here for various genes that we know. For example, the breast cancer gene, the BRCA gene, uh, can be found right here. And we can take a look at this gene. And we'll tell you that it's in chromosome 17. If you go back to uh, P53, you will see that it will take you to that position of the P53 gene, which is actually on chromosome 1. So you can see how this is a huge amount of data very difficult to scroll through and just look at things from that perspective, but very informative if you are no, if you know what you are looking for. So let's try another type of an analysis. Another type of an analysis is when we want to identify somatic mutations. And somatic mutations means that one, we have one uh, type of uh, sa one sample from, let's say, the tumor and another sample from, let's say, the blood sample, the normal sample of the same person. And we can separate the germline mutations from the somatic mutations. So how is that done? We can, again, pre-process our data, align the data to the reference genome, and then do what's called somatic mutation calling. So, for example, using Strelka. Strelka is a method for somatic SNV, single nucleotide variation, and small indole detection from sequencing data of matched tumor normal samples. So you can see the representation of what this algorithm does and what it ultimately produces, and produces a variant call file called VCF file. Uh, we can also use another method, method called uh, somatic sniper. And it's important to understand that for a lot of these uh, steps, you can use multiple alternatives, and maybe these alternatives will produce different types of results. Um, but in this case, you get a zip file that will include both uh, a text file that is a table of each individual positions and a variant call file. And the variant call file, the VCF file, can actually be further explored by looking at just somatic mutation. So again, just a quick review here. Uh, we looked at coverage. Uh, we looked at different positions on the GTF file in the genome. And we looked at how do we understand what type of information we're looking at and where are those important positions for us to look at. We also saw how it's not a straightforward process for us to just browse through all of the information that we have, that is really where the need for data analysis comes in. And one of the things that we talked about is the P53 gene, the gene in chromosome, uh, yeah, chromosome 11, I think, uh, is supposed to be where, uh, or chromosome 17, yes, sorry, uh, that we can now interpret, right, being an important gene in the tumor uh, or in the cancer uh, when we are trying to analyze for cancer mutation. So this is an example of how we can visualize the VCF file. And here you can see the P53 gene. Uh, this is the human genome. So you can see it's in uh, the human genome has to be uh, used as the reference. And then we have the chromosome 17, the positions of this gene, and those individual mutations, somatic mutations in this gene. Now, how does this all to this problem of precision treatment of breast cancer? To talk about this and to uh, take any questions that you might have, I am going to pass on the host to Pratim. And Pratim uh, Chakraborty is, has a PhD in bioinformatics uh, and uh, has been a trainer with Pine Biotech with um, 
uh, with us for a, n- a number of months. Uh, and he'll be able to walk you through some of the project design ideas and answer any of your questions about this, um, about what I've shown so far. So I'm going to transfer this over to Pratim. Pratim, yeah. please. Thank you, Elia. Uh, yeah, can you hear me, all of you guys? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, should I share my screen or should you continue sharing? Oh, yeah, okay. I am going to. I stopped sharing my screen and I think you now should be able Perfect. to. Perfect. So I think all of you are able to see my screen now. So yes, any questions you have, which I would like to answer whatever Elia covered is, uh, thank you for that. It was a pretty good, uh, you know, a sufficient understanding from the previous lecture that what we are going to cover on. And these are some of the applications that you can find uh, in front of you, uh, like modeling precision treatment of breast cancer, because breast cancer have several subtypes like clot and low or uh, normal or basal, or, uh, you know, there are some other classes as well. And maybe these things, uh, these, these, uh, this map out here right now makes sense a little bit of to you about the coverage or the mutations that are being shown out here and also the phenomics uh, thing, the molecular profiling of the breast cancer and also the coverage because the coverage is very important when it comes to uh, next generation sequencing because uh, a good coverage uh, definitely gives you uh, uh, all those details about those data. So uh, this is one of the article, very significant article, which is there and right in front of you. So where we try to understand the um, cancer profiles by using the machine learning principles, which are going to cover in this course, entire length of this course for the uh, next three months. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then I would like to go to, uh, you know, uh, these are the, some of the projects which so reproducibility is the need of the hour. So what you need before jumping into some project or trying to do some uh, solving some problems, you need to have the biological questions pretty well defined in your mind. I would definitely like to help you guys to, uh, you know, uh, doing this project, which is a very important part of this course. So two months of intensive learning, which will be guided by uh, experts like Elia, Darko and Mohit. And uh, thereafter, you have to embark yourself in doing uh, the project, whatever you have learned, to analyze the data. So uh, these are some of the archives from where you can get your data from. One of them is Sequence Street Archive, which is a part of NCBI. NCBI is a data warehouse where uh, uh, these are uh, the, the data has been submitted by various from various experiments. And on the left, you can find you know transcriptome analysis of Spodoptera frugipada. This is one of the projects which are available in our educational platform. Those of you who are part of this course, you'll be able to access it. Those of you who are not yet a part of this course, you will also be able to access it. But again, you know, you need the server credentials, which is a part of this course. Anybody who wants to join, I think I have already pasted the link in the chat. You can get back to us via our email, or you can get back to us, uh, you know, directly pay into the course and then join it and carry on with the for for the next three months. Okay, anyone, any questions you have? I would take a, take a, want to take a pause here. And I think many of you uh, who are already a part of this course, you can unmute yourself and ask me. So we have a question in the chat. Let's see. Uh, server login pipeline, are we covering Sarcos too? What, what do you exactly mean by Sarcos? If you may uh, tell us, Sunika. Oh, so I, I think Sunita, it, it would be best. Uh, it would be best uh, where. Uh, so if you have log on onto the server, can you really tell us what is Sarcos? Yeah, thank you, Darko. I think that kind of answers your question. Okay, if I if I may move on. So, uh, so the omics logic training program, uh, which is going to cover uh, for the next three months, is going to be very intensive in uh, trying to understand the uh, 
uh, data processing and analysis and visualizations. In any sort of uh, academic or research or industrial exercise or industrial project, uh, what you need to do, the most of the data that Elia already told you about is unstructured. You know, uh, when it comes to, uh, if you really look at the NGS data, they are kind of uh, being produced by different type of machines. And all those machines produce different type of, uh, you know, formats. So what the major problem in the big data domain right now is to structure the data. It, when it comes to any other domain than biomedical domain, if you go to the uh, you know, electronics uh, data or electrical data or any sort of data out there, the, the important part is structuring the data from the unstructured form. Even in uh, biomedical data uh, domain, big data domain, uh, besides NGS, there are electronic health records or electronic medical records. There are several points that there, there are images, there are pixels, you know, the electronic medical records contain the name of the person, the gender of the person, the age and the height and the BMI and all those uh, typical uh, important things that you have to kind of fill up a form in your uh, pathological labs or in the clinic. So connecting all those EMR data sets, which are basically clinical data sets, uh, these are uh, piling up in a huge way and thereby producing the uh, level of the the actual deluge of the big data. So this is highly unstructured. So whatever processes that has been shown to you by Elia on the pre-processing part, thereby we try to structure it properly because if you don't structure it properly, it would, uh, the statistical principles that are being used uh, that we are intending to use as a part of the machine learning at the same time, it won't be applicable because genomics data coming directly from the platform from any sort of NGS experiment does not follow normal distribution. Standard normal distribution is an essential uh, starting point for analyzing data in the, with the statistical tools. So before you actually try to find all those patterns, the mutational variant or the differential gene expression or the differential variants, all those uh, somatic mutations and germline mutation, it is essential that you need to structure the data first. That's an advantage, and that's also is a big disadvantage as well. So, but I know you know there are processes to circumvent the disadvantages out here to structure it properly, because uh, um, if you have all those uh, uh, you know, raw short reads, which are kind of have to be mapped onto the genome, have we have to kind of get the whole sequence out of it, then then only we'll be able to find out those significant genes and also those important uh, biomarkers which can be used in precision medicine or uh, in any other domains uh, that are being used right now. Different concepts are coming up, you know, because epitranscriptome, epigenome is also is something which I already earlier covered. So histone modification, the methylation of it. So single cell transcriptomics, these are also, you know, producing huge amount of data. But again, this is unstructured. And we teach you out here in this course to uh, do the structuring of the data, the processing of the data, and definitely big data has a very important factor, which is visualization. Because until and unless you visualize something in front of you in a, in a, in a, in a big good way, you would definitely be able to understand that where does your data fall? What class that your data, data fall into? So you have a hypothesis, you have a bi biological hypothesis to prove. And this hypothesis, uh, whether it really makes sense or not, if you visualize the data, that would be the best thing to do at your end. And, uh, you know, the, the methods that we teach you, uh, we would try to, uh, you know, uh, guide you through the, uh, during the entire length of this course, has clinical perspective, have research perspective, and obviously pharmaceutical projects. You know, uh, there are significant uh, pharmaceutical projects or significant uh, pharmaceutical uh, problems which are occurring at the end of the day, uh, which are coming up, uh, you know, they are being addressed. They has to be addressed from the big data perspective. So we uh, teach you the methods and we help you to apply those methods in those three perspectives. I think most of the uh, participants out here belong to that domain. And if you don't are not belonging to that domain, if you are uh, you know, trying to understand the data science principles, of course, the principles that we teach out here is applicable for any sort of data. So be it biomedical data or any other data, only the structuring principles will be different. You know, the data types will be different. So the basic principles remaining the same uh, uh, whether it's biomedical data or the, 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 the question will differ. So that has to be, you know, would be a good exercise for you to go through this course and have a hang of things. So in, throughout the entire length of our course, we give a lot of pointers. 
will give you a lot of pointers to uh, learn about it. We do not really, uh, you know, it's it's our lecture. We do not. It is not intended to, you know, just mug the things up. So that's why we have built that educational platform, which actually supplements the server platform. So any of one, any of the, those of you who have registered for the course have already had the access to the server. So run a lot of demo pipelines. Try to understand the input files. That's why the demo pipelines are there for. So and that would really help you to figure out a way to, you know, how, uh, you know, you can really match uh, or cope with the type of the things that we're going to cover in the entire three months, of course. And uh, you know, uh, this, uh, we can design and prepare and plan your analysis and make it impactful because that is the whole idea of it. This is a hands-on uh, learning course. It's not about theories only. So you have to know the essential theories which will be covered in detail. And you will also be guided through the projects, uh, you know, uh, the project which can come as a novel project from your part, or you can uh, do some of the projects that we have in the in our in our educational platform. You can go to them, try to understand the reproducibility of the research. That's the important part of it. So once a research can be reproduced, the methods, if you have a very clear idea about the methods that you are, uh, you know, you're going to follow, that would really translate in the process of your own research. So, uh, so that's that's the whole idea of uh, this omics logic training program. And uh, as a result of this omics logic training program, you will have a very detailed portfolio. Yes, anybody have any question? Uh, Ronak, could you um, mute yourself, please? Ronak, can you mute yourself, please? Thank you very much. So, uh, you know, as a part of this Omics Logic training program, the whole idea of is to help you to build your portfolio. I have heard, I've, I've come across many, uh, many participants uh, here in this course who are interested to learn data science as a whole. And definitely, you know, until and unless you actually uh, dig your hand into the soil, you won't be able to understand how deep is the soil or how, how, how dirty is the soil. So that's what it is all about in our program that you can build your portfolio and can say upfront that, okay, I know this and I know the algorithms and I know the uh, basic procedures of machine learning principles. And uh, because you have, you know, that's the whole idea of it to build, to do the project. And, uh, you know, the biomedical research. So uh, also for people who are uh, for doing academic research and as well as for those people who are doing industrial research, these type of courses would definitely help you because we have worked in industries for a long time. We have seen that, you know, in the in, in the real life uh, examples that are being thrown at you from your clients. It's all about uh, the research. Uh, you know, you have to understand the data. You have to structure the data. Try to understand the biological question your client is trying to uh, solve and help those clients to uh, solve those questions. So uh, courses like this would definitely help you to uh, critically understand the uh, scientific concepts behind it in the biomedical domain. And of course, as a part of your course, uh, we would also be helping you out to understand, to read research publications, because that's the only way you can really advance your knowledge to a different level. So because most of the uh, elementary research which goes on uh, in the academia are have some translation and applications in that industry as well. So uh, biomedical research is uh, will be uh, clarified to you and the research publications uh, would be shared with you. And also if you come across any research publications, which is of your own interest for your own work, we can help you to decipher that, to uh, demystify that as a part of your doing your project. And uh, definitely the certification uh, is very important in any sort of course. So the, the, the course, entire length of the course uh, is for three months. At the end of that, you would get a certificate, which is inter internationally accredited. It comes from Pine Biotech. It comes from uh, Tauber Bioinformatic Research Center, from where we are a technological spin-off. And uh, you know, at the same time, uh, as a part of this course, the the educational platform have a number of modules uh, hovering around the genomics, uh, transcriptomics, metagenomics, epigenomics, uh, etc. So all these modules also have significant individual certificates when you complete the courses. 
So you can, you know, you have to know the data sources because if you do not know a uh, data source, uh, you cannot really call yourself, uh, uh, you know, uh, a proper data scientist. You know, uh, what 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 is need to be done as a data scientist? You need to understand where the data is coming from, and how the data is structured, and how what what sort of uh, you know things that parameters need to be set to make your unstructured data into a structured way. So that's what we are trying to teach here as a part of the biomedical data science course. So uh, you can understand the basic principles of the uh, data and also the basic uh, methods which are used to structure the data. So, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and the project at the end of the course would help you to, uh, to make your learning into a translational, uh, into, into a translational objective. So, uh, so this this course have a, a pre-assessment and a post-assessment and a midterm assessment. Would really like to understand uh, that what you have really learned, where were you, and at the end of the course, where what where are you? So that's very important. We call our courses extended MOOC, uh, extended massive online course, because we have a very strong feedback system. As you can understand, we have you know significant teams sitting uh, here to help you out with your. Uh, queries and your understanding. So we are available via chat. We are available via many of the uh, social media platforms. Uh, the number of questions I can see. Uh, uh, this has been uh, Darko. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, thank you, Darko. So yeah. Sunita, so, you have a question to ask? Okay, so this much uh, from my side, I would uh, really like to take up any questions if you have, if you want to join the program, I have already posted the link out there in the, uh, in the link uh, in the chat. If you are, uh, if you're, if you're not aware of the link, uh, I would like to post uh, the link once again to you. And uh, I would be really happy to take up questions. So we'll be covering, again, we'll be covering uh, the data sources. And we'll be covering all those analytical uh, pipelines which are used to analyze those data and come up to a plausible in, uh, interpretation in terms of genomics, in terms of transcriptomics, in terms of metagenomics as well, and epigenomics as well. And we will also be covering, uh, you know, a lot of uh, things which comes as inherently to biomedical data analysis, which is, uh, you know, data visualization. And we use our studio. We have an expert with us, Darko. Darko is the is a, a Darko Ali and Mohit would be helping you out to really understand all those code modifications at the level of at the level of the programming level. So you can uh, you can uh, you know run the pipeline. You can uh, we have a uh, the the our scripts are downloadable and you can use all those downstream analysis using the R Studio and uh, really come up with an interpretable. So uh, that much from, from my side, I would be happy to answer your question. If you have anything, you can paste in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask me. You can see many questions in the chat, let me. Uh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. So I think Apar, thank you Apar for posting the link. Uh, if you want to join the program, that's the link. You can see on my screen edu.t-bio.info slash organizations slash omics logic hyphen data science slash. So this is the place where you can go, you can find the curriculum you're going to cover. And also you would be, uh, you know, we can help you out to register. If you are not being able to pay and register, uh, you can send email to us uh, at, uh, uh, you know, at uh, this place, pratin at the rate of pine.bio or uh, marketing at the rate pine.bio and yeah thank you apart and uh, yes mohit uh, pratim and marketing uh, we have bipsha with us bipsha is our uh, community manager she will help you out to um, solve your problem and help you to join in the course though this is the second session the next session uh, is uh, on uh, uh, you know this is the entire length of the course and i think i'm over i would be happy to answer you or if you don't have any questions i think we are already uh, you know at the end of our session we would uh, either end here or transfer the stage to elia elia if you're around
Okay, I think you know uh, we are good to go, and I think we have answered most of your questions. And uh, I think we have given you sufficient understanding about why this course is important to you, and if you are really wanting to jump onto the biomedical domain as well as fortified with the data science principles. So data science is a very important thing, as you know, because all of you are kind of well aware of it. That's why you are here. So I don't want to reiterate the fact. The point is that you know uh, this is a perfect place for you to begin and get an international accreditation, and thereafter go on with your. Uh, in your uh, career as uh, with these uh, skills that we give you as a part of this course thank you very much